Okay, so I'd like to thank you guys for uh, joining us here this evening. And uh, thank you to Duane for, for doing this. Um, I think this is something that, you know, with talking to him the last week or so, I think you guys can gain a little bit of knowledge um, and take back to yourself to teach the goalies that you guys are teaching. So without further ado, I'll let Duane kind of kick it off here. He, he's going to probably talk for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and then we will get into the questions that um, you guys submitted for discussion. We will I will ask you that, um, like I said, I will mute you. If you do have another question or you want him to elaborate on something else um, that he's talking about, I encourage you to use the chat box on the left-hand side. And uh, all questions will be geared that way, and then uh, Dwayne can answer them through the chat box. Oh, thanks, Maddie. And hopefully everyone's uh, safe, healthy uh, during this new normal, I guess is the, the what they're calling it or the, the trend word is. So we're here to talk about goaltending. So don't, uh, Maddie and I had a couple of talks here and he got me riled up a little bit. Uh, so I promised I wouldn't, wouldn't throw some people under the bus, but uh, I'll do my best not to, Matt. So I know you're recording it. But uh, for me, um, what makes a good goalie or how do you make a good goalie? It, it's really not making a goalie. You need them. You need to give them the information and let them deal with it. Um, you're the tour guide pretty much all the way through this. You're, you're the guy just giving direction. You don't want to tell them they have to do something. Um, just because you always want them to figure it out on their own. Um, for me, my teaching philosophies have changed a little bit over the years. So obviously, I started coach, coaching goalies when I was like 10, um, believe it or not, and then started playing pro, ran, in the, ran my own goalie school with Bob Mason, the goalie coach in Minnesota, and worked at a lot of goalie schools growing up. Um, but for me, my philosophies haven't changed except for newer era kids. They all want the whys and the hows. Um, so really, that's that's the only change that I've made um, in, in teaching the kids. We want to give them the whys. We want to give them the hows because the way they, the millennials are, and I'm sure you guys all coached enough of them, they, they're more visual. They need to see things. So, and they need to know the whys before they can, can actually do it. So, you know, for me, that's the only change I've made um, in my, in my teaching career. And, you know, the, there's not much change in the game. Um, to be honest with you from when Johnny Bauer and Glenn Hall and um, started playing the game to what, what we have now, what we have now, um, the only thing's really changed is goalies go down now. But when the guys are going down, it's the same philosophy, same ideas of getting there. Um, so, you know, for, for me, I focus on my foundations when I start teaching with any goalie. Um, even, you know, this year we got a, a 20 year old guy with the Victoria Royal, Shane Farkas was his name. I went right, right to the foundations, um, and my foundation points are movements, number one, two, your stick and hands, three is your head. Those three things are, are the key, and key points for me personally when I'm teaching, it's like building a house. If you have a weak foundation, you can only go so high. So what we did, we totally stripped Farkas down um, and got into his movements first. Uh, and then focus on his sticks, focus on his hands, and then we built him back up again until he got hurt. Um, I think in January, uh, he had a pretty good good month in January. It was goalie of the month, and then he ended up getting hurt. Um, so um, for me, that's my foundation. That's what I work with, and that's how I, I develop and, and want to develop. And that goes from a 20-year-old all the way down to, to a 5-year-old or a 6-year-old. Uh, and I'll walk through that part of it, um, you know, how I started. And it's simple. Like, I, it's everyone wants to do hard things and tough things. 
I focus on the simple things. You know, stick work, number one. Uh, you know, I'll get the goalies, especially the young goalies. I get them using their sticks and deflecting things to the corners and then build up from there. Then I'll work on the hands and then their, then their angles eventually at the end of it. Um, but before I even get the sticks, I focus on movements. When we run our goalie schools uh, with Mace and I, we do two hours of ice. And we do two sessions, um, four hours a day. The first 45 minutes of both ice sessions is strictly movements. There's no pucks on the ice. There isn't anything else except for goalies moving. And, you know, it's saving us now uh, with the, the permanent markers, but we could draw creases all over the ice and, and do it before we're just using pucks and having our – our arena guys make creases for us in the one end, so the goalies can use the use the crease for for movements. But we focus on movements, and we break the movements down from just simple shuffles, all the way up to. For me, I like to use pivots. Um, other people call transitions. It's just if you look at my feet, my hands are my feet. It's just when you move your hand, your feet this way. So, on average, that motion there. Um, in an average NHL game, that happens 400 times. And I asked Shane, that was one of our first movements that we did with Shane this year. I said, have you ever worked on this? He goes, no. And I said, why? And he goes, well, I don't know. I go, you, and I asked him the question, how many times it happens in an NHL game? And he said, I don't know. I said, 400 times. And you haven't worked on it once. So why not? You know, so those are the things that I try to do. I try to give them the reasons I ask why I let them try to do things and then try to give them information and let them see how it makes them more efficient of a mover. And then once I get them there, that now I got them. And then we just build from there, but it's just building that trust and trying to find ways to build that trust one with movements and then building up. And like I said, like with Shane, <laughs> He thought I was crazy for the first three weeks because, uh, um, you know, we did it with Griffin Alhouse too and all the guys in in Anaheim with John Gibson and Freddie Anderson as well. You know, it was just foundation, right to the basics, strip them right down and build up. And for me, if you have the foundations, we can build anything we want and, you know, we don't even teach – I don't even teach technical stuff with these guys until – probably two months into the season, you know, so if we're working with younger kids, you know, it's, you know, I try not to touch on technical things. Um, there's a reason why I don't want to touch on it and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but then once I, so we go to our movements, we go to our sticks, we go to our hands, we go to our head and eyes, and then now I introduce the butterfly and doing everything, repeat everything again with being the sticks, our head, our hands, all all in a butterfly position. Then I introduce the movements into all those repetitions. So movements in the stick stays, movements in the hand and glove. And that the movement in the head and eyes are are sort of pretty much attached. If if you're moving properly they're attached. And the reason why I feel stick work is important, I, I relay it to the kids and, and, my, and my pro guys is your, your stick is like a steering wheel of a car. Wherever your stick goes, you're going to go. And, you know, and, and for me to prove them um, how, how important a stick is, I'll get them down on their, in a butterfly, have a puck in front of them. I said, you, where you pick a spot on the ice, you tell me where it is, you know, blue line, door, post, whatever you want. Um, the train over there where the water bottles are, wherever you want to go on the ice, you let me know where, and then I'll get you there. And as long as you keep your stick on the puck. And so I'll just drag them all over the ice, and they're just following me with their stick, and I'm doing, you know, circles and all that stuff. And I'll get them there. And, you know, if your stick is on the puck, all the time you're always going to be on angle your your head will follow that trajectory you should be square all the time so um that's why i feel stick is so important and you know 
it's a good foundation for me and it's just something that uh, I, I don't want to get into some of the questions that are already asked, but something that we're lacking in Canada compared to the rest of the world with, with our, with, is our stick work. You know, and a lot of that blame on the stick manufacturers. Uh, you know, I used a 24 and a half inch paddle and I don't think you can buy a paddle height shorter than 26 in a, in a retail shop. Um, we have a goalie with the Royals that's six four, and I cut his paddle down two inches, and now we got his hands in the proper position. Um, so just you know, when you're looking at stick, make sure you, the stick is in a proper position to have success when you're doing that, some of this foundational work. Um, for me, the reason why I try not to teach, get into technical um, too much, is if we think back to when goalie goaltending sort of changed into the style that it is today. And that's, you know, obviously Patrick Waugh was the, the first guy that really did the butterfly slides and, and reverse ages and all those things, um, you know, but the biggest thing that, that everyone took from, from Patrick Waugh was he was a blocker, right? So now all of a sudden when coaches are teaching, they're teaching blocking, but, if you go back and if you have some time and pull up some video of Patrick, Patrick was probably one of the better movers in the game. You know, uh, you know, he had Brodeurs, he had, you had quick, who's a great mover. Price is a good mover. Patrick was up there with them. And, you know, so for me, that's why I try not to get into the technical. And that's where I feel that us as a group generalizing here, we get into the technical and then we have some issues because we forget about movement. We forget about teaching moving. Um, you know, I had Jonas, Jonas Hiller in, in Anaheim who was with Francois Allaire um, after Patrick, after he left Patrick. And I forget who we were playing, but Jonas, Jonas was like, he just put his hands up in the air. And I'm like, Pat, uh, Jonas, you can't do that. You're embarrassing your teammates. It was well. I was in position. I just dropped and the puck didn't hit me. I'm like, well, you got to make a save. You got to be able to do different things. He goes, no, that's it. So, you know, that took a, a lot to change his mindset. And, and he finished off his career with a different mindset. But, you know, for me, that's where we as a group, I, and I hate to say we, I just generalize around the world. Um, when Patrick came out and had so much success, we started teaching blocking and we forgot about some of the key foundations of movement in our stick work. You know, so I think we've, we've sort of hurt ourselves. We've gone backwards that way. Um, you know, I know hockey Canada, we've talked to, we've had meetings after meetings with them. We, we sat in a room one uh, about five, six years ago and spent 14 hours in there talking about, you know, what we can do for, to help goaltending and it was myself, Sean Burke, Freddie Brathwaite, Bill Ramford, Rick Wamsley uh, were all in the meeting uh, with uh, I think some branch guys from all over Canada and uh, then Hockey Canada. Dave Marcou was, <clears throat> excuse me, running Hockey Canada at the time. So, you know, number one thing that the guys who, who had played um, the, the game, first thing they said was movements and you know, for me, if, if everyone else is saying it, then, you know, uh, that's a key thing. So, um, so that for, for me, that, those are my beliefs. And, and when I do talk to goalies and when I try to express my beliefs, I try not to get into, well, I did this, so you got to do this. I, I try to let them understand, sort of like when I said earlier about millennials, I try to let them sort of figure it out on their own um when for me a guy needs to fail before he's going to listen and um you know you know I'll get back to Shane Farkas uh, this year like he came in he had a good start then he just he dropped off the face of the earth for two months we had to go back and one focus on his stick focus on his movements but he was he wasn't square at all like literally we we put the ropes, you know, the old ropes on the eyes, on the posts. And, 
I painted lines on the ice for angles. And so he would understand where, where he was in the net. And he was flattening out on every shot. Um, when I mean by flattening, if, if that's a puck, his feet would be like this along the goal line. And, you know, it'd be, he'd be giving up the whole net. And, you know, so it was a long process. It was actually about four weeks of, of working on specific things with him just to get his movements back to being efficient and being square. And it takes a while. And, and sometimes during a season, it, it's hard to do. And we had the fortunate, we, we were lucky, sorry. Um, we had a goalie who was backing up, who was, who was capable of play. So it didn't hurt us um, in the standings. Um, and it gave Shane some time to rest and, you know, and focus on his game. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's tough to do, but it's, you know, to get a guy to revamp his movements and revamp some things, it takes some time. So, you know, you're better off doing major overhauls like a glove position and stick position and movements um, like in the summertime yeah. and then fine tuning throughout the winter time if, if you have that luxury to deal with the guy all summer long. So um, that's it. Any questions so far? Um, with that, uh, Addy, do you have anything? Nothing's popping up on the chat um, okay. for now. Um, I guess we can go to the second question since you answered number one. Uh, so the second one is, in your opinion, does holding edges longer give a goaltender a better opportunity to prepare for a shot? Yes. Yes, for sure. Um, for me, I see a lot of goalie goalies down first and then react to reacting to the shots and reacting to the plays. If we're, if we're holding our edges um, and that's why I find it, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Uh, I was uh, talking to Rick Wamsley about this uh, uh, about six months ago. I was putting a little stat packet together um, just for me, for when I'm scouting and just want to just picking his brain on what, uh, what he thinks makes, you know, his five best attributes for a goalie when you're scouting. Um, the first thing he said is catching a puck on your feet. When was the last time you saw a goalie catch, his puck, catch a puck on your feet? You know, for me, it's key. If you can hold your feet, it doesn't matter what happens. If the puck, play gets tipped and it goes to a player, now at least you can move. Um, and, you know, the longer you're on your feet, the better it is. Now you're... You're creating, you're always got a power foot when you're on your feet. And I don't want to get into bashing the reverse HV, but, you know, that's one thing with the reverse HV. You have zero power. Um, so if you're on your feet, you have the ability to move with it, whatever's happening. And then then you can react to the play. You know, if, you know, shot's high, you stay on your feet. If it's down low, you can get in the butterfly and go from there. Great. So um, I guess the combination to that question would be, how do you assist a goaltender to hold their edges longer during a pre-shot movement as the tendency now is to slide to location? Yeah. And that's, you know, they give back to my foundation um, stuff. We, my first, when I go through foundations, the first part of it, I do everything on their feet. I, the goalies don't go down in a butterfly and probably for a week. Um, and then we'll get, then we'll end up getting into the butterfly after that. So I try to do any pre-shot routines. I'm trying to get them to move on feet, unless we're working on a blow, blow the goal line play where it's a bang bang, where you got to get into a slide or or backdoor pass across where we have to get into a slide right away. But still, when you're getting in the slides and, and getting into that, you're still in a, you still have edge work you're still on your feet and then you're going into it so you still have a power leg and for me it, the power leg is is key so it, if you're on your feet and then so when you're doing a drill get them to do two or three stops movement to a position movement to a position and then into the shot um, that sort of forces the guys to to sort of stay on their feet a little longer and then when you're doing warm-ups you know, I see so many guys in pregame warm-up, they're doing blocker gloves on their knees. 
Oh, let's do that on their understanding. Um, it's easier on our backs to actually go with coaches who are shooting. It's easier on your backs because it's, you know, you're not having to put it so low. You can just stand up and just flip them in there. Um, so, like, getting them out of their comfort zone of catching pucks on their feet, doing stuff on their feet all the time, and the repetition of that does carry over into a game. Awesome. So you mentioned some things that young Canadian goaltenders are lacking. What areas do you think young goalies in Canada are good at? Uh, you know, I, I think one thing with Canadian goalies, we the will and a want to succeed usually make us better. And, you know, I think we, we've fallen behind in a lot of areas, but – you know, the guys who excel, um, the flurries of the world in modern era, you know, the prices of the world, uh, they do not give up on any any shot. So our will and want and our battle level uh, is a lot higher than, than most countries. Um, you know, I don't want to say it's, it's higher, but, uh, you know, that's probably our, our biggest def- difference between the rest of the world is that um and you know i if you're if i go to a game and watch watch guys if i don't look at their nationality i'm not going to be able to pick out a canadian guy over an american guy uh, before we used or or a european guy before the difference was you saw goalies catch pucks you know our canadian goalies would always catch pucks where europeans and americans didn't um, that would that was a telltale sign that he was a Canadian. But now uh, we don't we don't seem to catch pucks as as, as we used to. Awesome. Uh, what areas or philosophies do you think goalie coaches are getting wrong, and what areas or philosophies do you think uh, goalie coaches are excelling at? Yeah, that's uh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, generally speaking, goalie coaches, we, we worry about to, generally speaking, most guys worry too much about technique. Um, you know, that's, uh, I'm watching a, watching a guy do a goalie, goalie session with a, a six-year-old kid and he's doing reverse HVs and doing butterfly slides. And he's doing all this stuff with the kid when the kid could barely move. And you know, you're working on something that the kid's probably never, ever going to use in a game today because he's so young, you know, why not focus on just moving and staying on your feet? And, and that just goes through all the ranks is, you know, like there's, we're not focusing enough on movements. We're not focusing enough on stick work. We're not focusing enough on proper hand positions, um, we're focusing on reverse HVs. We're focusing on, you know, things that should never, ever go in. Um, and, but we're creating holes. We're teaching those things that we shouldn't be teaching. We should be just focusing on some of these just general saves, the simple saves. And um, to touch on that, like when I do, I have a shot chart that I use and it has 10 scoring chances um, that the finish model uh, came up with. And I use analytics with it. If it's a straight shot, nobody in front of me, and depending on where, where the shot comes from, if it's from the blue line, that's three goals against, you know, and I, I use that. So now I can compare apples to apples um, instead of apples and oranges. So if a guy gets 60 shots a game, and his goals against is this, and a guy is 19 shots a game, and his goals against is this, and I can ch- I can look at that and say, where's the hard shots coming from? Who's giving up more quality shots? And then in the same time with in Anaheim, when I started doing this, I started using it for me to teach our goalies as well. Um, so John Gibson was giving up shots high blocker day in and day out and high glove you know, why, what was happening before those. And I was using that to help me teach him. And then Freddie Anderson was a different animal where he was almost too aggressive where we had to pull him back. Um, And then things that we're doing well, I think 
generally speaking, again, I hate to keep on saying generally speaking, but when we do focus on the foundations and and I think a lot of guys are are not getting caught up in in following what the NHL guys are doing. Um, you know, for the most part, we had we had half the country over here that are focusing on technical, then the other half over here that's focusing on just the foundation part of it. And the people that are focusing on the foundation part of it, their goalies are having a lot more success when they're getting to the older ages, when they're playing junior and potentially playing pro. Okay, Hugh Foster wrote a question in the uh, chat box here. It says, does Dwayne weight the scoring situations during his analysis? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, so when I, um, when I was in Anaheim and we're designing this, uh, uh, my analytics thing. And so I was doing my own shot chart and we just hired a, uh, analytics company that was working with our team. So, um, the next day I get his report in and he's saying, well, uh, there was, a, it was a backdoor tap in goal. Uh, it was, uh, Thornton coming wide and passes across to, uh, um, I'm trying to think of his name. It was actually Burns coming in from the point. And it was it was a two on one, but it was a goal line drive, and our D men didn't play it well, so it goes over to him uh, to Burns, and he taps it in the net. And you know the analytics guy is telling me that Freddie's got to have that. I'm like, okay. So you say he should have that, but there was a wrist shot from the blue line that went in, and there was some traffic in front, but he didn't need to have that. I said, okay, well that's now we're talking totally different here. I see something totally different than you do. We need that thing, that goal there, the back to tap in is impossible to stop. Unless he gets lucky, it's impossible to stop. But the other one that sort of went through some traffic, that's easy to stop. And so, so we started changing. So backdoor tap ins and depending on the situation before I, I had things down to 0.25% of a goal and things up to three and a half to four goals against, uh, depending on what it is. You know, a shot from the red line, it's six goals against. And, you know, and that's pretty tough to come back unless you're you're stopping things that are backdoor tap-ins day in and day out. There's another one here. Hold on. Um, if you were to focus on training... In the off ice, would you suggest a greater emphasis be devoted to core development and strengthening or game related activities? That's from Rory Peters. Yeah, I think for sure leg strength and core is, is key. Um, and one thing that, you know, we used to do a lot um, with my trainer who, who who's trained a lot of guys and actually Freddie Anderson, I has been training with him here for the last, I want to say seven, eight years. We focus on some small muscles first when we first, when we first start training. Um, we're doing, you know, we're on PVC piping, rolling our ankles out. We're doing different things. We're trying to um, strengthen the small muscles around our bigger joints. Um, so like our knees and all that, all those things, we're trying to take stress off of our, our joints and, and strengthen the fine, the finer, smaller muscles. And then also one thing that gets overlooked for goaltenders is, is back. Um, your upper back, obviously your, your hands are constantly moving. You're constantly, you know, for me, the way I like to teach is, you know, your stick and head, everything's going together like this. Uh, you know, that's a lot of back muscle. Um, so we did a lot of back, a lot of legs, a lot of core. Um, and if you ask my wife today, I still need to do more core, but, uh, every day it's, uh, you know, when you're training, it's, it's constantly focusing on those things, but we need to focus on your legs, your core and your back for the most. Awesome. There's another one here in the chat box. Uh, Stephen Larry's wondering, you mentioned using ropes and drawing lines to teach angles. Are there any systems or types of zone mapping that you use to develop proper positioning? Well, um, so if you, you know, I'm sure we've all 
if we're all goalies uh, growing up, we, we had those ropes. So we sort of knew um, where we needed to be. Um, so what we're doing is just, we're doing the same thing with the ropes, but we're painting lines on the ice. Um, so I just put a little dashes through, so you're on your angle. Uh, and so it gives you a visual of knowing when you're square, when you're on the puck, um, when you're in a proper position. So it's the same thing as like having a rope there, but you can have live practices with it. So that was one of the things that we did with Shane, um, painted the lines on the ice, which helped him, but also on the other side, it helped our, our shooters, our, our players, knowing to, when they're looking, oh, the goalie's off angle or the goalie's here, the goalie's here. Now I can shoot here, you know, so it gave our players a benefit um, as well. But, it, you know, putting those lines on the ice, you can actually go through a full practice with it uh, or a goalie session with it. You can do whatever you want with it because it doesn't affect anything that goes on except for, you know, your snow gets a little different color. I usually use, uh, try to use orange, almost um, like the the liners, outside liner that the, the construction guys use. And it's just water-based, so the Zamboni guy just floods right over it and picks it right up. So um, if you have questions, talk to your Zamboni guys. Um, they'll, they'll let you know exactly what they can use, and they may even have something in the back um, to, to be able to use. Perfect. There's another one here too. Uh, David Ricci is wondering when you talked about the drill uh, following the puck with the goalie stick. Is the goalie on his feet or knees or both? Uh, you can do it either way. Um, you can do it on their feet. You can do it on on their knees. Um, for the older guys, I do it on their knees because um, I want to give because <laughs> they don't believe me. So I want to give them a nice little conditioning workout at the same time. So. Um, so I always hope that they pick a far far place, but. Uh, you know, you can do it in both ways. Um, for the younger guys, uh, I do it on their feet and then, then the older guys on, on their knees. Okay. And then Angela Mallory is wondering, do you teach this with the stick always on the ice, whether on feet or knees? And then she just has in brackets, highly debated in Saskatchewan. Yeah. Um, always stick on the ice. Um, you know, and I, I see why. It gets debated, and and like I said earlier when I was talking uh, to you about cutting down our goalie's uh, paddle height, when he was on his butterfly, he couldn't put a stick blade on the ice. Um, his arms, like he's 6'4", his, his hands would go down below his knees, so imagine him using a 26-inch paddle. And so his arms would be sort of like this when he's in a butterfly. So... You know, we cut down the paddle height. Now, when he's in a butterfly, now it sticks nice and flat in a good position. Um, so, getting that, getting the goalies down and making sure their stick is in a good position. A lot of it is their paddle height, um, especially you know when we we're when I was growing up, and I hate to use the term when I was, but um, we always had junior goalie sticks. We had small little goalie sticks, and. You know, now you go in a sports store, there isn't a small one. They're all big, big sticks with everyone's name on it that played in the NHL. That's, oh, well, that's their pattern. No, it's not even close to their pattern. And, um, you know, my buddy had a bunch of my sticks here in a local sports store here. And I went in, I'm like, it's not even close to my pattern. And, you know, so for guys buying sticks, buy the stick that's right for you, that's right for your goalies. Um, and it's easy to, to find it, but it's hard to, to, if a guy's small, it's hard to find the stick now. Um, you know, you might just have to cut down the shoulders uh, on the paddle height just to, to get it in a proper position for him. Awesome. So that, there's no more in the chat box. We'll just go back to the questions that we had for the pre one. Uh, so okay. the next one is, what do you think of the top mistakes head coaches make when integrating goalies into a team practice? They don't understand, that's for sure. Um, it, it's, you know, number one thing for me with with coaches is they want the goalie coach there for, well, should I pull the guy? Or who should be playing? They don't want your feedback for practices because they have their, their mindset on what they want to do. So they, you know, for, for me, 
you know, talking to coaches and getting dialogue with them was the number one thing for me. The sooner I could get to them and start talking to them and understanding what their mindset is and how they handled adversity, then I would be able to go into them and say, hey, I need five minutes here. I need five minutes here. Uh, can I get five minutes at the end of practice? Um, and trying to deal with it that way. Get to know the coaches well. And if you have a personal relationship with them already, um, then it's a little bit easier saying, hey, I need five minutes here. I'm, I'll be below the goal line. I got a whole bunch of stuff. I, I just give me the goal line to the boards. You have the rest of the ice. You can warm the guys up. I just need some time to warm up our goalies. And then um, with us, with the Royals and, and at the NHL level, our first – our first drill usually is a, we call a pass shoot score. Uh, it's you know it's fundamentals for our players and and the shots are you know pro shots. We call them pro shots. Uh, it's just coming down, shooting as hard as you can, but knees and blow. You're not shooting a score. You're there to warm up the goalies. Uh, one, it actually helps our players hit the net because uh, they're focusing on warming up their goalies. And two, it gives your goalies some time just to you know, feel the puck and, and focus on on uh, getting pucks to the corner, focusing on rebound control. Awesome. Uh, the next one is, do you see teams trying to work the 10 scoring scenarios into a practice plan? And should that be an important part of a practice plan? Um, I haven't seen teams go out and specifically work on the 10 scoring chances. Um, you know, Take us for example with the Royals. We have we have um, what we believe how we can score goals designed by our for our team. Um, we like to use blind, behind the net, um, use below the goal line stuff, and try to go to low to slot and things like that. You know, so I think teams sort of focus on their strengths. They're not really focusing on um, the ten scoring chances per se and uh, for me you know if I, teams will be working on one or two of of those 10 scoring chances types of things in their practice great there's uh, another one in the chat here uh do you still promote the stick flip backhand behind the net well yeah if you're a righty like I was, and I, I had to go lefty, uh, then then yes, uh, I no, it's it's to each their own. For me, it's you know, it was just uh, something that I was able to learn younger. Um, well, I was fortunate enough to have some great coaches when I was a kid. Uh, one was a goalie, one wasn't, but his son was a goalie, so he was out every day. So when we're focusing on passing, you know, it forced me to do a little left hand. And then as I got older, I, I started goofing around and learning that I could actually air the puck out on my backhand and um, started doing it in college. And it was our penalty killing thing. <laughs> we, we uh, used to kill penalties if the teams would dump it in. I was out and air it out. So, you know, if a guy's good at it, then yeah. Um, but I think the more that you can get these guys handling pucks and teaching them the proper way to handle it, uh, you know, it's, I think it's an asset uh, that the guys can have. And um, getting back to, you know, Freddie, Freddie Anderson in, in Anaheim, when we were there, like, we had a set play that if they dumped it in, especially if he was on his knees, he, Freddie could air the puck out when he was on his knees to the far blue line um, in the air. So Corey Perry would wait at the far blue line and he would just come across the middle of the ice and try to catch it almost like a quarterback to a wide receiver. Um, so, but it was a set play. So if you have guys that can handle the puck, I would encourage it. But the thing is, us goalie coaches, we want them to handle it. We want to encourage it. Head coaches see the goals against and then all of a sudden it's like, you can't handle the puck anymore. Hey, you know, it's just like a player. We're going to make mistakes handling the puck. We're going to we're going to give the puck up. We're going to turn it over. We're going to, it's just, you know, we have oven mitts out there trying to pass a puck. So, you know, 
you got to live with those mistakes if you're going to ask a guy to go out and play it. And, you know, I think it's, it's great that they do. Great. Uh, back to the pre uh, questions playing minor hockey and up through the pros. Was there anything you found repeated, repeatedly frustrating? What could have been done to reduce that frustration? I, I think growing up in minor hockey, I was fortunate enough, like I said earlier, that I had great coaches. So, um, I played on a, on a really strong hockey team and, you know, Rob Blake was one of my teammates growing up and, you know, so we, we had some success and I was fortunate enough to have some great goaltending coaches in the area uh, where one head coach was a goalie and then Rick Wamsley's from the area. So, um, so I had, I was able to get some teaching from them when I was younger, but when I turned pro, um, you know, it, it was a long way for me. I was stand-up skate save goalie in, in college. Uh, for the young guy on, on a video chat here, he probably doesn't know what a skate save is, but uh, pretty much that's all I did, uh, stand up and skate saves. So um, once I turned pro, Roland Lawson was my goalie coach at the time, and we pretty much he hammered into to me of the butterfly slide and, and doing all these different things and sort of made me into the goalie that I was that um, over my career. And then I had two goalie coaches during my career uh, try to change the way I play. They wanted me to pe become blockers. They wanted me to stay on the goal line and become a blocker. And, you know, for me, I couldn't do that. I mean, that's just not the way I played. Uh, you know, I would always be flat. I'd always let bad goals in. So, you know, that for me was challenging. Uh, you know, he's your coach. You got to respect him. How do you deal with it? And, you know, the last time was when I was in Tampa uh, right at the end of my career. And I finally, you know, said to the guy, I said, let me coach myself for the rest of the year. And, you know, it was a tough conversation, but, um, you know, it worked out. And the other one was uh, when I was in Buffalo, I was playing behind Dominic Kasich. So, I said, uh, you know, for me, you know, let me focus on my game. Let me you focus on Dom. And, um, you know, but it takes a while to build up the courage to, to tell a guy, you know. But at that point, I, I knew enough about how I needed to play to have success. And I was able to go to them and have, a, you know, an adult conversation with them. So... Uh, that was the toughest thing for me, deal, having to deal with those things uh, growing up and, and playing pro. Awesome. There's another one in the chat here. As a goalie coach, you are sort of seen as the middleman between the head coach and the goalie. Do you ever find it difficult to understand or adapt to the expectations the coach has of the goalie? Um, yes. Yes, you do. And, you know, you know I'm fortunate enough with – with uh, our coaching staff in Victoria, uh, you know, Dan was a former goalie. So, so it's nice to, you know, he, he's pretty realistic, but uh, when I was in coaching pro with, uh, with Norfolk in the, in the minors and, and with Anaheim, uh, Bruce Boudreau was pretty hard on his goalies. And so was Trent Yanni, who was a Norfolk coach uh, trying to explain to them, well, you know, this goal, is not a bad goal and trying to get them to understand it is tough. It's frustrating. And they're thinking that, you know, every, every goal is stoppable, which technically they are, but they, they get hard on goalies and, you know, having a con conversation with them and just sort of, you can't, you know, they're, they get paid to be the head coach and, monitor lines and players and you know the last thing they want to deal was with is goalies but at the same time you, they're the heart the goalies are the most critical you know looked at the most critical uh league and you know you got to sort of take the brunt of that and so i would deal with a lot of that myself i would just all right bruce why are you mad at our goalies okay what's up and I would try to keep him away from our goalies and I would let him vent to me. And then I would sort of try to talk him off the cliff and say, Oh yeah, I agree with you or no, this is, this is, 
what I see. This is what I think. And and then by the time when you have those conversations, he tends they tend to relax by the end of it and say, okay, you got this. And then by the end of the end of my time with Bruce and I spent three years with him, you know, I think halfway through the first year, it was like, there was never a question about goaltending except for who should we start? And, you know, cause he trusted that I had had his back. He trusted that I was going to do the right thing. If there anything that came up, he came to me directly or he'd shoot me a text and say, Hey, let's have a chat in the morning. Cause I want to talk to you about, you know, Hill, Hillsy letting in these goals or whatever. And, you know, he would, he would address it and we'd talk about it and then I would deal with it. Um, Cause the last thing you want to do is, is deal with a goalie's confidence. And if you're talking to the goalie, it's easier than the head coach trying to be critical when he doesn't, most of the time doesn't know what he's talking about. Perfect. There's another one in the chat here. Do you have experience coaching youth, varied skill level? If so, do you apply these same coaching philosophies, training, drills, etc.? Yes, I, I have. Um, so I've I've taught from. <laughs> I think my youngest was like four years old. And so all the way up to to I had a sixty year old goalie who was just he's been playing for five years. So you know you know and I you know, did exactly the same thing. Focus on movements and just, that's the key is focusing on the movements. Once you become mobile and the net, then you can add almost anything. Um, you know, we, I do a lot of balance drills and a lot of goofy things, uh, to work on balance to make it fun, especially for the young kids. Uh, you know, we had a, we do these leg hops where you've got to hop over your stick and you know, we sort of got rid of this, the stick because it was most of the guys were chopping up sticks and now uh, sticks are two hundred dollars so I didn't want to get into the parents uh, budget too much so I just use a marker on the line uh, just a marker on the ice and they can hop over that but we had a ten year old he could do just hopping over that line or actually it was a stick at a time he could do up to seventy five one leg without putting his leg down you know you know just doing goofy things like that helps their movement and you can you know with the varying degrees you can goof around and play with it as much as you want or go as hard as you want to to get the most for the kid and focusing on just the small simple things with it with a with somebody who doesn't have the highest skills is is key and this you want to give them the confidence that they can do it and then then keep on building from there Perfect. We got a few more in the chat box here. Now, what type of visualization techniques do you, do you suggest or recommend for the young goalies to develop their game? Um, I think a lot of, watching a lot of games, um, watching hockey is, is key. Which you know, we don't get it as much. You don't see guys doing it as much. Um, you, everyone's playing the game. Um, with Xbox or whatever, or just no road hockey anymore. Um, for me personally, I I try to have our guys visualize uh, what they're going to see. Uh, you know, now with at the junior level and pro level, you you get a lot of clips and video clips of the other team's power play. You get a lot of clips on you know Ovechkin with his one timer from you know, on the top of the circle, you know, day in and day out. Visualize making those saves. Visualize what you need to do to make those saves. You know, first um, term I use is pivot. You know, you got to pivot. Then you got to push. You got to get there, get set, get square. Um, you know, visualize doing those things day in and day out. Uh, you know, for the minor hockey guys, you know, if you're playing the same team over and over again, you get to know who's who's good on the other team. You get to know what their strategies are, how they're trying to score. You know, then you start visualizing that way. Uh, for for me personally, when I when I was playing, I always took two minutes before I went on the ice, um, before warm ups, before every period, where I just visualized angles. I visualized okay. You know, because every rink was different, obviously, at the pro level. Uh, you know, visualize where I needed to be. I just visualized my angles, you know, 
then I visualize who we're playing, what they're doing, and then went from there. Awesome. Another one in the chat box. Angela Mallory is wondering, when the goalie is tracking the puck on their feet anywhere in the zone but outside of the slot, do you have your goalies have their stick on on the ice in a full stance or in the air tracking up high? Um, I always have – I want my goalies in my stance. In, in there's two reasons why. Um, if they're out of their stance, what do they got to do if a puck gets shot? They got to get into their stance, and then they're probably going to react. Whether well, probably 99 percent, they're going to drop to the knees. With the way goaltending is now, where most saves are on their knees. So now you just went through three eye changes, eye level changes. So. You're standing completely straight up, then you come into your stance, and then you're going to come down into on your knees. You know, my eyesight was pretty good when I played. I did a lot of visual stuff. I probably couldn't do it, um, you know, to make a clean save when I got to do through do three eye level changes um, to be able to track the puck in properly. And I always tell our guys to be ready at when the puck's at the red line. Um, you know, as it's coming in, be ready at the red line. You never know when they're going to shoot. And so I rather my guys be in their stance, ready for anything that happens. Uh, you know, you get guys scoring from below the goal line. Uh, you know, guys made a career out of it. Kretzky would throw pucks there. Steve Smith lost to Stanley Cup because of it. Uh, you know, Pierre Turgeon used to shoot at the goalie's knees from below the goal line because goalies weren't ready at the time. Yeah, you know, until when guys become ready and they're always ready for anything, there's less chance that a bad goal is going to go in at the wrong time. And, um, you know, that's just my philosophy. That's my belief. But, you know, other people have different reasons for being out of their stance. But and another reason, if you're in your stance, your knees are bent and you have more power when you're moving, um, try to jump when you're standing standing straight up and your knees are straight, you can't jump very high. Now, if your knees are bent, you can jump pretty high. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you should be in your stance. And it's, I don't want to get into it, but it's one of those philosophies that I disagree with, with um, people moving around out of their stance. Perfect. One more in the chat. Stephen Larry is wondering, when growing up, what ignited you to put the work in? Um, I, there's a lot of, a lot of things. And I think obviously my, my parents were, or my dad was a construction worker growing up. So, you know, it's seeing him get up at four o'clock every morning to take me to hockey practice and then go to work and, and then willing to come home and play with me at night or do stuff at the house with me and how he put the work in to, make us a family and be able to support us and then have time for me at the end of it. And then, uh, then I was the youngest kid on the block. Uh, so I wanted to strive, uh, every day to be able to play with the big boys and, and road hockey, which, um, you know, my neighbor was, uh, was a cousin of mine who was drafted to Montreal Canadiens as a goalie as well. And, um, you know, so I always looked up to him. So I always wanted to be the guy that, that could play with the big guys uh, every day. And, you know, so, you know, I think just pushing yourself and just believing in yourself, you will give you the drive to succeed at the, at the end of the day. And it doesn't matter whether it's hockey or, or life in, in general. Awesome. So there's no more in the chat, but we got a few more to cover in the pre ones. So the mental aspect of the game is very important. What mental tips do you use to help prepare for a game or use during a game? And then any other additional comments on the mental aspect of the game? Yeah, the mental aspect is is huge. And I, I didn't know it at the time. Uh, you know, I, I just I would just play the games. And then my first year pro, um, the other assistant goalie coach at the time was by the name of Bill Hughes. Uh, he played in Michigan Tech, uh, never really did much else. Um, he, I think he coached in Calgary for a couple of years, but he gave me this book called Inside Edge. 
uh, Ian Gordon was actually my second year pro. Ian Gordon was the other goalie on our team. He gave it to Ian and I and said, read this, read this book. And it was just a small book. Um, Peter Jacobson, he's a Canadian author. It's called Inside Edge. And he goes, read the book and tell me if there's anything in this book that you, that you could use to help you guys. And I took two, two things out of that book and, and I use it still today. I use it to our goalies. I give it, I give a recommendation to all my goalies uh, to use it. And, and two of the things that I use is called parking and framing. And it's as simple as it sounds. You know, you go to the mall, you lock your car, you leave it, you come back to it later. So you let a bad goal in, you, you got to forget about it, come back to it later, deal with it later. Um, you know, realistically, once once a bad goal goes in or a goal goes in, you know, we're the only guys that, you know, we got to deal with a red light going on, everybody in the building cheering. And then you got to, you know, at the pro level, you get the video trying to replay the goal against, and you got 10 seconds to really refocus and get ready to go again. Because if you're thinking of that, that goal that just went in, usually the next shot goes in. So being able to reset, I call them mental resets. So being able to park that and come back to it later is a key, um, especially, uh, you know, for goalies that get a lot of shots, um, you know, these get, they get scored on a lot, um, especially in the youth level and being able to reset it and give them a tool to help them and understand how to use this tool to, to reset is key. And then framing, framing is simple as it sounds. You can take any picture in the world and put a bad frame on it. that looks bad. You put a good frame on it. It looks great. And, um, so I was in a little story here, uh, David Hearn, a Canadian golfer at the time, uh, where I was playing at Tampa, he's, he was staying at the house and he's just like, ah, this golf course, I never made a cut here, never made a cut in college, never made a cut pro. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he was like, well, this, I just don't like this course. I said, well, do me a favor. When you do your practice walkthrough on Monday and Tuesday, find one thing on every hole that you like. Give it to your caddy and let him write it write it down. As soon as you put the whole ball in the hole, he's talking about the thing that you like on the next hole. He ended up being like finishing top seven or something like that in that tournament. You know, he gave me a call after he said that was awesome. It was so relaxing to go play. And you know, we have goalies have mental blocks of you know bad arenas, places that they can't play in. You know, for me, Edmonton. You know, I could not win a game in Edmonton until I actually played in Edmonton. Um, you know, I hated that building. I hated going in there to play. You know, trying to frame my mindset about playing in there, and especially when I get traded there, it's like, whoa, this is like my, this is one of the worst, worst places I could have got traded to. I, I don't play well in this building and getting, finding things in buildings that make you happy, make you excited and make you want to play. Um, it just sets you in the right spot, sets you up to have success, um, you know, and that's just framing it the right way. Awesome. There's just one, we're going to go on to the one in the chat here. Uh, what are your philosophies on dealing with traffic? That's from Sheldon Gortzen. You know, for, for me, dealing with traffic is, you know, it's, it's the game now. Um, you have to find release points. You have to find, um, you have to be able to deal with the traffic and not let it bother you too much. And back to uh, the, the other question about being out of your stance. This is one area where I will allow you to be out of your stance or where I talk to my guys about being out of their stance. Uh, you know, being able to find that release point. You got to be looking up. You got to be looking down and around guys uh, or girls. You got to be, you know, for me, I like to look through legs. Uh, because I played low, you know, Freddie Anderson, he's six, four, he can look over guys and, you know, whatever the easiest way for you to find the release point, find the puck and then deal with the, the shot after. Once you know where the release is going or where the puck trajectory is going to, to the area than that, then it's easy for you to push into or move into that area. And, you know, hopefully it comes through it. Um, 
that's something we'll talk about at the end of this. Uh, uh, some eye training stuff that uh, that I used to do, which helped me through uh, through traffic to help find things through traffic. Great. So then Is back to it? the yeah. No, that's oh. good. Sorry. Did you have something to add to that? No, no, that's good. Okay. So then back to the mental aspect. Um, what are some of the mental and physical techniques you use to endure the grind of a season? Uh, once you left the game, you had to get away. For me, I had to get away. Um, I think my career took off once I was married and I had a family. Uh, because, you know, when I was younger in my career, I'd have a bad day at the rink, whether it was practice. I'd go home and I'd stew on it. I'd be thinking about practice. You know, I didn't have something where I can totally forget about the rink. And, you know, once you get away, once that is done and getting back to parking, you know, the rink is the rink. Outside of the rink is, you know, life. And for me, being able to segregate the two and being able to push it away and you know bad things didn't last long when when you were able to get away from it uh, you know so every morning when I came to practice or when I came to the rink you know I was refreshed mentally and I was excited about getting to the rink so you know which made it made a lot more fun to play and it made it a lot easier to work hard and you wanted to be there for your teammates at the end of it. And, you know, so for me, being able to get away from the game, uh, you know, that's not meaning, you know, I watched hockey every night. I sat and watched hockey with my kids. Yeah, I just didn't, we didn't talk about what I was doing. We didn't talk about what happened at the rink unless they're down for practice and goofing around with the guys or whatever. And, you know, we talk about that, but we never really talked about what happened in the game or, or the practice. And then, you know, it's a long season. So you mentally get tired, physically get tired. And knowing when you're getting mentally and physically tired, being able to push back and get away, you know, getting, getting the proper rest and, you know, hopefully getting days off. And for the younger guys, I, I see it a lot. And, you know, in coaching in the Western League, we're fortunate enough. Our our coach believes in in rest uh, more than practice, and so our guys are well rested. And you know, the more rest and sleep these guys can get, the better it is. And you know, mentally they're coming to practice and they're they're in better spirits because they're they're rested. Awesome. Uh, so the last one of the pre. Uh, questions is do you use an evaluation tool when evaluating goalies if so what does it consist of yes so i touched on a little bit earlier um so you know i when i'm scouting goalies i have uh, my analytic charts and you know so i'm i'm charting the the situations that are going on and, and it's based on the um the 10 scoring chances so i use that uh, when i when i'm charting guys you know, if I'm going to see them regularly, if I'm going to see them over a five-game period, then if I'm scouting a guy, then then I'm going to use that chart. Um, if not, I ha I created my own um, little scouting tip, uh, little little Excel spreadsheet that I have. Uh, I have ten things on there that I that I I mark off. Um, you know, at the top of the list are is rebound control movements hands so obviously you, you can see where i'm going with it and then then below that is bounce back ability you know what happens when he lets a bad goal in does he does he let the next one in does he forget about it does he you know is he able to to handle that um some you know somebody runs him over as he loses his mind like i used to or is he staying calm and, and forgetting about it just things like that the things that i believe are are key and that will translate into the pro game then i had that on on my uh, little spreadsheet and then then i just you know every game i just it's a new new one and then at the end it's averaged out and you know i put the keys uh, keys of the game 
uh, his keys and, and what happened in the game. It's almost, if anybody's been on RankNet, it's similar to RankNet, but it's a little bit more uh, goalie specific. And, you know, so I was doing some freelancing, uh, um, scouting for the Los Angeles Kings at the end of the year. So I, I sent them in. I was watching three goalies for them. And, you know, they, they're perfect. They're like, this is great. Everything we need to know. And they're able to, you know, make a choice between goalies and, and see where they need to spend more money or, or send guys to develop guys a little bit more in their own organization. Great, great answer. Um, so then there's one more in the chat here. David Rieke's wondering how long until goalies can be under six foot two and get drafted. Oh. David, I fight with that uh, every day. <laughs> we had Griffin Alhaus. All he did was stop pucks in the Western League. And trying to find him uh, a spot to play pro was so tough. It was, cra- it was crazy. Um, it came down. He was going to U of A starting in September. And this was, I think he signed his contract with Winnipeg in early August. But we were battling for three years. And, you know, I say to guys, when was the last goalie to win a Stanley Cup that was over 6'2"? You know, it was Matt Murray, but before that was Ken Dryden. So why are we worried about 6'2 goalies or 6'4 goalies? Why, why do we need big goalies? And, you know, it's a battle that I, I've had, you know, it's frustrating trying to talk to guys and, and I was talking to one scout and he said, if I bring a goalie in under six, four, my, my GM doesn't even want to look at it. So for me, it's frustrating. Um, and it's unfortunate. That's what GMs think. And until we can prove them wrong and, and keep on proving them wrong and yes. With the small guys winning Santa Cups, it, it's not going to change, unfortunately. Okay, there's another one in the chat here. Um, Hugh Foster says, I'm in my 40s. Hockey used to be more seasonal. Now it's all season long. Is there too much hockey? Yes and no. Um, there is too much hockey, and I, I think that's why you see some of these strange injuries now. Um see goalies with you know knees and hips uh, that they you never used to see before you know part of that is is you know how how things are being taught and but a lot of that is just they're on the ice way too much and there is like i said getting away from the game and getting rest is key and you know like obviously with the time off now like i, I got a 19 and 17 year old who both are looking to go to college and um, playing the BCHL, you know, right at the end of the season, they they take time off. They're they're off. I make it mandatory for them to stay off um, and work out and train. Fix your body. Let your body heal. Um, let your your hockey muscles sort of take a rest and start developing the rest of your body. So now, like I said earlier, and you know, when I first started training with with my trainer as we we try to strengthen the small muscles you know you don't use small muscles when you're skating um you know you know we talk about foundation like you're in a boot for six to eight months out of the year you know your ankles get weak so our first thing would be doing ankle rolls on pvc piping to strengthen up our ankles and our perennials and things like that to build up the strength that we just lost throughout the season. So if you're skating every day, if you're on the ice 12 months a year, you don't have time for, for those muscles to heal, for one. You don't have time to train the rest of your body uh, to to get stronger and to protect those bigger muscles and bigger joints in your body. Awesome. Um do you have anything else to add? That was all the questions, and I don't, I don't see any more in the chat. But if you guys have anything else for Dwayne, um, you know, we're kind of we're 
an hour and 15 minutes here now or whatever, but. So I got, I got a couple of things here, Matt, that um, might be able to help. I think one for guys, if you're, if you need to make a crease, I don't know if anybody's ever told you, um, if you use those big jumbo markers, if you peg one post down and then use the marker and to spin the net around and then center it back on, that's your, that's the actual crease. So you can make a crease anywhere. So if you're doing stuff below the goal line or doing things like that, it's, it's easy to do. Um, you can make a crease anywhere you want on the ice. And especially if you're, if you're doing specific crease movement drills um, and you want to do it in the corner, if your coach gives you the time to, to do some warm ups with the guys, then that's a good one. And then talking about eye training stuff and watching pucks through traffic or trying to find pucks through traffic. Uh, my sports vision guy who's an optometrist here in Buffalo, uh, we used a strobe light. And so obviously with strobe lights, if anybody's got epilepsy, they can't use it. But uh, we would, in a lighted room, have the strobe light turned up and throw a ball off the wall, catch it with the other hand and constantly just go back and forth then shut the lights off and gradually turn down the frequency of the strobe light. So now the strobe's just flecking like that. So it's like seeing the puck release and then trying to figure out where it's going to go. So you're just alternating, catching in, in opposite hands and you just gradually get down to, to finding, um, you know, to hardly any light at all. And then once you turn the lights back on, you shut the strobe light off, you actually see the spin of the ball. Like if you, you see the lines, so I use the tennis ball, you can see the lines, you can see the spin. Um, but it's, it's a good tool to be able to use for, for your guys if, they're, if you're dealing with a lot of traffic and trying to find release points and trying to pick up pucks through once you, once you lose it to be able to find it again. Okay, there's a couple more in the chat here. Um, Hugh Foster is wondering, lots of goalies have, the off -se have their off-season sports um, that help develop certain skills, um, i.e. badminton. What do you like as an off-season sport? Um, for me, uh, I'm a little biased because I had an op option to, to either choose this sport or, or play hockey. So uh, I played soccer growing up, um, played semi-pro soccer in London, Ontario, and then um, had some offers to go to Europe uh, uh, at the same time I, I was at university. So but I decided to finish my career or finish my degree, get my degree, and then uh, went into hockey. But, uh, you know, now there's so many sports. Uh, you know, my guys love field lacrosse. Uh, they play soccer. There's so many crossover sports that um, for guys, if, if you're, if you're a goalie, you want to, you want to play baseball, you know, hand eye stuff, uh, you know, badminton's a great one. You know, it's just a lot of different things you can do to one train your body, have, have, get a, get away from the game. Um, and there's so many other crossover things and have fun. You can have, they can have fun and be kids at that time. And, and I think it's, it's very important for, for guys to be able to play different sports. Awesome. You guys have anything else? Absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. No problem. Anytime. Stephen Larry's wondering, can you let go without talking about 2006? Well, I, I can. Um, I try not to think about it anymore. It hurts too much, but uh, we just uh, we just did a little thing with uh, with Sportsnet and the Edmonton Oilers uh, last week. So yeah, it's frustrating, and you know it's just part of the game, unfortunately. And you know, so close, but at the end of it, uh, we we weren't able to to win it. And it's the fortunate part. Our unfortunate part about sports is injuries. Hundred percent. I'm a huge Oiler fan, so <laughs> I think uh, Ricky just wants me to unmute him here. I think he has a question that he wants to ask you. I just 
Thank you. I had access to that the whole time, Matt. So sorry. Um, no, that's all right. That's the first longest I've ever been muted. So, uh, <laughs> Dwayne, first of all, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, we, uh, some of us here, we have a, a goalie community. We're starting. We, we have some teaching. Or there's a group of us that are coaches, and there's a lot of other veteran coaches here. But I got some younger ones, and uh, just to hear you, I mean, younger that they didn't even watch 2006 playoffs. We had to explain the backhand flip and the Cujo and uh, what Rollis and so. But I think what we focus on is a lot that you said is getting kids back on their feet because they're just trapped on that post RVH or lost on their knees. And like I said, the 6-2 thing, it's gross. I mean, uh, you got Nolan Meyer with the blades out here. who had 75 wins by 17. And back when I played, you know, I'm 32, that's a first rounder just about because he won games and that's really what it is. And now these kids are robots. Do you find that getting some of them out of that robotic technique that they've developed or they've watched is getting them maybe more success because I'm finding for let them be a little more athletic with control. We're getting more success and almost more engaged. And I'm just coming back to the coaching side. So that's just my perspective. What have you seen in your tenure with this? Yeah, it's sort of like a, I agree 100%. Um, sort of like when I touched on Patrick Waugh, right? Uh, and Jonas Hill are like, guys were teaching blocking and no athleticism at all. Just stay on the goal line. Just let the puck come to you or, or hit you. If it doesn't hit you, it's not your fault. And getting guys more athletic, you know, the, the flurries of the world, um, being able to dive across and, and make a glove save. Like, And you see... You see not just Fleury, you see uh, Carey Price, Hopi a couple of years ago in playoffs. Like It's that type of thing. Like You can't be perfect every night. You can't make a perfect save air, day in and day out. Every shot is not going to be a perfect reception by you. Sometimes you just have to make the save. And and at the end of the day, when, you know, you know, hate to go back to Jonas Hiller, but I said to Hilsey and we actually, we had to go out for dinner to, to talk about this because it was, uh, it was getting a little heated. So we, we, we went out for dinner and I said, Hilsey, I said, you've been in this game for I don't know, how many years now? You played over, you know, 400, 500 games. At the end of the day, sometimes you just got to make a save. Sometimes you just got to stop the puck. It, it's not about the technical. It's not, you're not getting scored on, the technique that you made to save with, you're getting scored on if the puck went in the net or not. At the end of the day, sometimes you just got to stop it. And he just sort of looked at me. He's like, I've never had anybody say that. I'm like, you know, you grew up, your brother plays soccer. Do the go- soccer goalies make perfect saves? No. You, you know, they're in position. Sometimes they're using their feet. Sometimes they're diving. Sometimes they're, you know, just just happen to be in the right spot. And sometimes you just got to be like that. You know, you know, she just got to make a save and getting kids to understand it doesn't, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to look pretty because you're not getting marked on pretty. You're getting marked on whether the puck crosses the goal line and the red light goes on and the fans start cheering or they don't. And at the end of the day, that's what they got to understand. And, we're starting to bring it back. Um, I told Matt I wouldn't get on the Hockey Canada thing, and I'm trying not to. And I'm so happy that you guys are doing this. And I think, you know, I said Matt, I told Matt um, last week that, you know, you this having this little call uh, video conference is probably the only province that's doing this. And I'm glad you guys are. And I told Matt, if anything you guys need, like, I want you guys, since you're doing this and putting time back in, to become the hockey capital, the goaltending capital of Canada. Like, I know you had two young guys that were up for the draft this year, and and I didn't get a chance to see them, but I heard that they were great. And, you know, keep doing this, keep doing it, and believing in the kids. And Like, getting back to you, it doesn't have to be pretty. You just got to stop it. And so it's great winners. that they, yeah, exactly. That's it. That's the old adage you're saying, man. And that's, it's, I wish it, you know, gets back to that, right? Because we can see, you know, big guys that are, just got the bones. And it's like, they don't have the twitch, though. And that's what bothers yeah. me. 
and you can see if they got the twitch in both and you just you gotta hope that they grow but in the end it's about having fun because we deal with all levels and in the end when we get their focus and they see oh i actually learned how to do that that's the key and we're just trying to make people a little better every day and you made us better early so i really appreciate that from game ready goaltending no problem anytime thanks Paul. Well, i'm gonna take you up on that thank you <laughs> Um, there's one more in the chat box, Dwayne. Uh, Michael yep. Keller's wondering, it seems that there are, are way more green shots than in years past. Movement is very important. How big is set feet for a save? Well, getting back to uh, uh, the earlier or question about being out of your stance and, and in your stance, uh, you know, for me, if your feet are set, you're going to get the puck clean. You're going to stop it clean. And, you know, when I talked about my scouting sheet, rebound control is at the top of the list. Your rebound control is probably not going to be there if your feet aren't set. And one thing with the game, the game is so fast now, the way the players are moving and passing and, you know, we're talking about pucks crossing the midline or the Royal Road, whatever terminology you want to use, if your feet aren't set, you're not going to be able to get back. And, you know, if it's past, you're not going to be able to get back to the other side of the Royal Road. You're not going to be able to do a lot of things to allow you to have success to be able to stop the puck. And, you know, for me, having your feet set is the key, number one thing. And that goes back to movements and edge work and be, being able to hold your edges as long as you can. And, and you know, it's it's something that is gone. Um, it's coming back, but it's coming back because the Europeans are bringing it back. Um, you know, the, I was telling Matt, uh, I don't know how many of you guys know this, but USA Hockey on their, their program to have 50% of NHL minutes by U.S. born goalies. You know, it's that's a big number and they're they're putting their money to what their mouth is and they're developing goalies left and right and unfortunately we we sort of took the back seat and you know once they got rid of the european goalies in the, in the chl they didn't, hockey canada didn't do enough to be able to get back to the foundation getting back to moving getting back to doing these things and getting back to doing stuff like this and so we're just starting to come back, but I don't know if it, you know, how long it's going to take because there's a lot of stuff that has to go on to be able to get our goalies back to where they were. That's it, Matt. That's the only thing I'm going to go on about Hockey Canada. I promise. You. That's perfect. Um, anything that's else? That's not for. That's not Dave McNabb either, by the way, or Corey, Corey McNabb. Corey McNabb either. Corey's been trying to do do things and for you guys as a group if you need stuff from hockey canada Corey is a great guy great person to have on your side and um he's he wants nothing but the best for goaltending in canada but unfortunately the higher ups aren't uh, allowing him to do what he needs to do that's great um this was absolutely incredible um the information that you went through with these guys was awesome um, I can't thank you enough for coming on here and doing this for us. Um, I just want to say thank you from SAS Hockey and all of us here for jumping on. I know it's late, <laughs> Odis, for you, but I really do appreciate you.